Good morning, Carson Bible Church. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. We have much to rejoice for. Uh, this morning, we are working through 2 Kings chapter 9 as we continue here. You remember that last week on Palm Sunday, uh, we read about some things that God was putting into place um, in ancient Israel and uh, Judah and we saw uh, an international conflict and we saw some of the key players are now all concentrated in one place in Jezreel. So we have King Joram wounded in battle. He's recovering in Jezreel. Uh, his mother, uh, Jezebel, who's still alive, she is in Jezreel because that is her sort of vacation palace. And then we have uh, King Ahaziah, who is um, king in the, the southern kingdom of Judah, who is um, Joram's nephew, actually. Uh, so we have this whole, uh, what we call the Omride dynasty, this whole family dynasty from King Omri, and that included uh, Ahab and Jezebel. Now they are on both thrones in Israel and in Judah. And it seems like all is lost. Uh, now Judah has fallen into Baal worship as well. The temple itself has now been corrupted with uh, Baal worship. And uh, it just seems like we keep seeing win after win for pagan, idolatrous, wicked, murderous Jezebel and her family. And uh, what we actually saw last week is that God is setting up pieces in place to carry out his sovereign plan. And we uh, made the connection just to uh, Palm Sunday as well is that um, God has set up all of the uh, strategic pieces in place. He has announced his chosen king and things will look very, very dark through the rest of that week through Good Friday, and it will seem like Satan has won. And then we come to Resurrection Sunday, and we come to 2 Kings chapter 9. We're going to uh, do just what we did last week, which is we'll work through our text, and we're just making a couple of observations. We'll make one point this morning. I'm going to pray, and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, God, we rejoice in your victory and triumph, even over death, disarming the power of sin. God, in fulfilling ancient prophecies, in showing your great sovereignty, your abundant life that you offer to all those who believe and confess Jesus of Nazareth as Lord and believe in his resurrection. God, we rejoice in resurrection because it means a secure salvation for all of us, poor, wretched, wretched, rebellious sinners, drowning in our own wickedness and sin, lost in spiritual death and darkness. And yet you have offered us abundant life, unending. God, we rejoice in who you are and everything that you've done. And we praise the name of Jesus, our risen Savior, who promises us a resurrection life in the future as well. We look to his return. We rejoice in the Holy Spirit and the seal of our salvation. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, 2 Kings chapter 9, let's work through this. It says, Then Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, Tie up your garments and take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when you arrive, look there for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and have him rise from among his fellows and lead him to an inner chamber. Then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus says the Lord, I, want, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and flee. Do not linger. So remember that 
King Jehoram and King Ahaziah have agreed to go to war with King Hazael of Syria. They're trying to recapture this strategic territory called Ramoth Gilead that um, previous kings of Syria had taken from Israel. Um, God in uh, 2 Kings, I'm sorry, in 1 Kings 19 had given the prophet Elijah uh, this sort of final commission and it was three points. One was to anoint Elisha as uh, his successor, uh, national prophet of Israel. Uh, two, to anoint Hazael as king over Syria. And three, to anoint Jehu as king over Israel. Uh, immediately, Elijah went and he anointed um, Elisha and begins discipling him and training him and, and uh, building him up to be uh, his successor. Uh, just in the last chapter, we saw that Elisha is continuing the work of that commission and he went and anointed Hazael to be king over Syria. Hazael assassinated Ben-Hadad, who is the existing king of Syria. And we know that Hazael is going to be brutal. He will be the scourge of Israel. Um, Elisha actually wept at the thought of all the brutality that Hazael will carry out against God's people Israel. And now we have uh, the third and final point of Elijah's last commission, which is to anoint Jehu. And we don't know who Jehu is. We've never heard of him. He's kind of out of nowhere, but um, God uh, knew who he had chosen. God had his plan in place. Uh, from several years prior. Jehu is a commander in Israel's army and he served even when uh, Ahab was king. And so here we have Elisha and he's taking one of these sons of the prophets, uh, one of the, the number of prophets that Elijah and Elisha had been discipling and training and educating for service and ministry. And Elisha gives him these instructions. We're not told the name of this uh, man, of the sons of the prophets, but uh, actually Jewish tradition holds that this was the prophet Jonah that we read about who was um, sent to preach to the Assyrians. Uh, other than tradition, we don't really have a lot to confirm or disconfirm that, but this type of ministry actually does have some uh, hallmark characteristics in common with what we do know of Jonah's ministry and that um, it's essentially uh, an international commission and it's also highly dangerous <laughs> and uh, somewhat undesirable of a call. But here we see Elisha uh, send this man, he says, uh, <clears throat> tie up your garments and take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. Uh, tie up your garments as in, um, you need to go quickly, go unhindered. And he says, when you arrive there, look for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. We're told he's the son of Nimshi to make sure that uh, we're, we're keeping clear when it says that he's the son of Jehoshaphat. He's not the son of who had been uh, King Jehoshaphat in the southern kingdom. This is a, a different Jehoshaphat. He says, have him rise from among his fellows and lead him to an inner chamber. Take the flask of oil, pour it on his head and say, thus says the Lord, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and flee. Do not linger. Um, see, I'm not sure why Elisha doesn't go himself. Uh, but this is going to be highly perilous. Uh, because nobody knows how the other commanders in the army are going to take this new anointing, this new proclamation of Jehu um, as the new king of Israel, especially while the existing king of Israel, um, yes, he's injured, but he's recovering. He's still alive. And so uh, he tells him, open the door and flee. Get out of there. Don't hang around. Verse 4, so the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he came, behold, the commanders of the army were in council. And he said, I have a word for you, O commander. And Jehu said, to which of us all? And he said, to you, O commander. So he arose and went into the house. And the young man poured the oil on his head, saying to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anoint you, king over the people of the Lord over Israel. And you shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master, so that I may avenge on Jezebel the blood of my servants, the prophets, 
and the blood of all the servants of the Lord. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free, in Israel. And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. And the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel, and none shall bury her. Then he opened the door and fled. So this uh, man of the sons of the prophets, he goes, he carries out the commission that Elisha gave him, and he, he gives this kind of lengthy anointing, this, this purpose that has come from the Lord, and it's to fulfill prophecy that was already spoken by the prophet Elijah, which is to end the line of Ahab, to not leave him any male heirs. And when Elijah had first confronted Ahab on this, and then he really took no action on it, it seemed like maybe it was just an empty thread or uh, it wasn't really going to go anywhere. But now here we see um, a few years later that God is making good on his promises. Sure enough, the man anoints Jehu and he opens the door and he flees. Verse 11, when Jehu came out to the servants of his master, they said to him, Is all well? Why did this mad fellow come to you? And he said to them, You know the fellow and his talk. And they said, That is not true. Tell us now. And he said, Thus and so he spoke to me, saying, Thus says the Lord, I anoint you king over Israel. Then in haste, every man of them took his garment and put it under him on the bare steps, and they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Jehu is king. Interesting. Jehu comes out of this room, whether they uh, can tell by the expression on his face, whether they recognize the son of the prophets and, and knew something uh, about his vocation, uh, whether they can tell by the oil that's on Jehu's head, I don't know, but they know that something's up. And they ask him, is everything okay? And he, Jehu tries to play it off at first, right? He, he tries to not make a big deal about it, but they don't let it go. They say, no, uh, you need to tell us what's going on, Jehu. And so he confesses. He says that the man came and has anointed him to be king of Israel. A dangerous proclamation, right? They, if they are loyal to King Joram, um, they might kill him there on the spot, but we see they do exa exactly as the people entering Jerusalem did on Palm Sunday in Christ's triumphal entry in Jerusalem, is that they lay their garments out in front of him, this sign that they immediately recognize him as king. They have no loyalty to wicked Joram. It says, in haste, they take their garments and put it under him on the bare steps, and they blow the trumpet and proclaim Jehu is king. And they, they do this here as commanders of the military. This is going to be a kind of a classic military coup. And um, so he already has the loyalty of other military commanders. And let's see where he goes from here. Verse 14, then Jehu the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram. Now Joram, with all Israel, had been on guard at Ramoth Gilead against Hazael, king of Syria. But King Joram had returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds the Syrians had given him when he fought with Hazael, king of Syria. So Jehu said, If this is your decision, then let no one slip out of the city and go and tell the news in Jezreel. Then Jehu mounted his chariot and went to Jezreel. For Joram lay there, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, had come down to visit Joram. Now you remember all those strategic people and important players that God has been putting into place when it seemed like everything was going against God's plan and everything was going for the plan of the enemies of God's people. Everything was looked like a win for Jezebel and her family. Everything looked like a win for foreign pagan worship. 
we see that all of those things are actually going to be their downfall. God has put all of the strategic leaders in one place. They're all in Jezreel together. And here comes Jehu, commander of the army and now anointed new king. And he has the loyalty of all the military. And they're abandoning essentially their post which was in Ramat Gilead to make war against the Syrians and try to recapture that area. And he's coming to Jezreel. You would think that he would come to Samaria, the capital, but Joram, Ahaziah, and Jezebel are all in Jezreel. And Jehu, because of his anointing, really sees himself as a prophecy fulfiller. And so there's a lot that is to be fulfilled here in Jezreel. So that's where they head. Verse 17. Now the watchman was standing on the tower in Jezreel, and he saw the company of Jehu as he came and said, I see a company. And Joram said, Take a horseman and send to meet them, and let him say, Is it peace? So a man on horseback went to meet him and said, Thus says the king, Is it peace? And Jehu said, What do you have to do with peace? Turn around and ride behind me. And the watchman reported, saying, The messenger reached them, but he's not coming back. And he sent out a second horseman who came to them and said, Thus the king has said, Is it peace? And Jehu answered, What do you have to do with peace? Turn around and ride behind me. Again, the watchman reported, He reached them, but he's not coming back. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously. So in Jezreel, being a, a, a secondary palace, kind of a vacation palace, there of course is a watchtower there. They have uh, someone posted and he sees a military company coming from the direction of Ramoth Gilead. And they really, at a time when they really shouldn't be, right? They're supposed to be there on the front line fighting. Now, why are they returning? And so uh, King Joram, remember he's injured, He's there trying to recover. He decides to send out a messenger. So they send a messenger out on horseback. And this is the question. Is it peace? And what he means is, did we win in Ramah Gilead? Are you coming back because you have won the battle, recaptured Ramah Gilead, and established peace at that border between us and Syria? That's the question. Jehu answers him, and he says... What do you have to do with peace? And he's not talking so much to the messenger, but he knows that messenger is from King Joram. What do you know about peace? So he tells the messenger, turn around and ride behind me. Meaning, join me, get into part of this company, or you're going to forfeit your life. So when the watchman sees that the messenger doesn't come back, they send a second messenger, basically with the same question, and the same thing happens. And as they are getting closer, the watchman recognizes Jehu's driving style. We're told that he drives furiously. See, Jehu is pretty reckless. He's kind of a loose cannon um, in his leadership, in his conduct, and in his driving. Um, they, they recognize his sort of recklessness. And then Joram pretty much knows what's happened. Verse 21, Joram said, Make ready. And they made ready his chariot. Then Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, set out, each in his chariot, and went to meet Jehu, and met him at the property of Naboth the Jezreelite. And when Joram saw Jehu, he said, Is it peace, Jehu? He answered, What peace can there be, so long as the whorings and sorceries of your mother Jezebel are so many? Then Joram reigned about and fled, saying to Ahaziah, Treachery, O Ahaziah. And Jehu drew his bow with his full strength and shot Joram between the shoulders, so that the arrow pierced his heart, and he sank in his chariot. And Jehu said to Bidkar his aide, Take him up and throw him on the plot of ground belonging to Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember, when you and I rode side by side behind Ahab his father, 
how the Lord made this pronouncement against him. As surely as I saw yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, declares the Lord, I will repay you on, the plot, on this plot of ground. Now therefore take him up and throw him on the plot of ground in accordance with the word of the Lord. So Joram is at least recovered well enough to ride in a chariot. He and King Ahaziah, so the two kings, come out from Jezreel and they go to meet Jehu. They themselves, probably hoping that uh, they can, uh, if this indeed is a rebellion, that they can use their authority to put it down. Of course, also a very dangerous place to put themselves in. And Jehu, again, zealous here for proper, proper worship of Yahweh, understands the puppeteering of Queen Jezebel, still exercising her influence and her power and her schemings over her son and then now also uh, his nephew Ahaziah through her daughter Atalia, who is his mother. And Jehu seeks to purge Israel and Judah not only of this Phoenician line of rulers, but really to purge uh, the, the nations of God's people of inappropriate idolatrous worship. Joram turns around to flee. He warns Ahaziah. And as, as he's fleeing, Jehu himself draws his bow and shoots him in the back. He has his aide take Joram's dead body and fling it onto the field of Naboth and Jezreelite. You remember uh, the, the treachery of Ahab and Jezebel there. When Ahab thought that he should be able to just take Naboth's vineyard because he thought it would make a nice garden for his palace. And they scheme and they conspire and they murder Naboth and his sons and they take the vineyard. And Elijah had confronted uh, Ahab there and Jehu sees himself. Jehu obviously was aware of that confrontation and the prophecy that Elijah had made against Ahab and he sees himself here fulfilling that prophecy. Finally, the justice that we've been waiting for, it feels like it was just completely forgotten, right? Remember how sick and disgusted that whole story of poor Naboth made us feel and it felt like there was no resolution and finally, we're getting the resolution that we wanted. Verse 27, when Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw this, he fled in the direction of Beth Hagen, and Jehu pursued him and said, shoot him also. And they shot him in the chariot at the ascent of Gur, which is by Ibleam. And he fled to Megiddo and died there. His servants carried him in a chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in his tomb with his fathers in the city of David. In the eleventh year of Joram, the son of Ahab, Ahaziah had begun to reign over Judah. Ahaziah, uh, by Joram's warning, manages to flee a little bit further. He escapes them for a little while, but Jehu has his men pursue him. They shoot him with an arrow also. He manages to escape a little bit further, but they uh, overtake him, and they do take him to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, he is still of the Davidic line at least partially, he uh, is buried there in the city of David. So now we have two kings assassinated, a few more items of business for Jehu to take care of. Verse 30, when Jehu came to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. And she painted her eyes and adorned her head and looked out of the window. And as Jehu entered the gate, she said, Is it peace? 
you Zimri, murderer of your master. And he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? Two or three eunuchs looked out at him. He said, Throw her down. So they threw her down. Some of her blood spattered on the wall and on the horses, and they trampled on her. And he went in and ate and drank, and he said, See now to this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. But when they went to bury her, they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and palms of her hands. When they came back and told him, he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Elijah the Tishbite. In the territory of Jezreel, the dog shall eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the corpse of Jezebel shall be as dung on the face of the field of the territory of Jezreel, so that no one can say, This is Jezebel. That final piece of business that Jehu needs to take care of is Jezebel herself. She's there in Jezreel. He comes into the city. She's obviously up in a tower of the palace, and he's below, outside. She adorns herself. She is royalty. She is kind of a queen regent. She is meeting the new king of Israel. So she gets fancied up, comes to the window, and then we hear her sarcasm. Is it peace? She knows it's not peace. And she calls him, you Zimri, murderer of your master. Remember in 1 Kings, Zimri assassinated his, the existing king, Elah. And then Zimri was only king for a couple of days. She's taunting him because of his assassination of her son. Jehu really doesn't even address her. He addresses her servants and he calls out to them, who's with me? And they seem to have no real loyalty to Jezebel. They throw her out the window and she falls to the ground. And she dies. Just this dishonorable, tragic, horrific death. Jehu's horses, uh, startled by her fall and her splatter, they trample her. Jehu leaves, he goes in to have a meal in the palace. And then it occurs to him to have her buried, but when they go out to find her corpse, it's been eaten by dogs, which of course was prophesied by Elijah. the sight of some of their gravest wickedness. Ahab's line is ended and Jezebel is killed and she can't even really be buried because she's been consumed by dogs, terribly dishonorable. And we're told that there's no place to bury her. There's not enough left of her so that no one can remember her. There's no grave site for her. Finally, finally, this is the, the moment, this is the justice that we've been waiting for. And on this Resurrection Sunday, the one point that I want to make is this. God cannot be outmaneuvered. Jezebel, for all of her scheming, for her treachery, for her murderous ways, for all of her wickedness and puppeteering, 
for her engineering of these political plots and schemes and her family now being on both thrones in Israel and Judah. And just when everything seemed so far off track, when everything seemed like a win for Jezebel, actually God was putting everything in place for his victory. God cannot be outmaneuvered. And it's, it seems so interesting that here, Jezebel from Phoenician royalty, so clever. And here she's undone by a couple of God's prophets and a reckless commander of Israel's army. It almost seems like it would be impossible, but God has engineered this. God is the one who set all of this up for his word to prove true. God cannot be outmaneuvered. E even when we read in 2 Chronicles chapter 21 about uh, some of this. King Jehoram, who was king in Judah, he receives a letter from the hand of Elijah confronting him on the murder of his siblings at the behest of his wife Atalia, Jezebel's daughter. And he's confronted in this letter from the prophet Elijah, but Elijah is long gone at that point. And even though Elijah didn't technically die, what in the world is going on? Is Elijah writing letters from the grave? No, it just shows us and it reminds us that not even a thing like death can thwart God's plans. Likely Elijah had pre-written the letter inspired by what God's Holy Spirit had revealed to him or uh, had written part of the letter and Elisha finished it and had it delivered to him. But for all of, all of the scheming and engineering and political maneuvering, God's word proves true. And it can't be stopped, can't be outmaneuvered, can't even be stopped by death. And on this Resurrection Sunday, that's exactly what we see sealed and proclaimed and finalized, is that on Good Friday, a moment where Satan seemed to have every advantage. All of Satan's best scheming and plotting and the worst torture and mistreatment of Jesus on the cross. All of the best work that Satan had, and yes, it looked like Satan had won. It looked like everything was hopeless. And it turns out that God was the engineer behind all of it, that God was not at all outmaneuvered by Satan's schemes and plotting, his wickedness and his treachery and his murderous intent, because by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus of Nazareth, God's one and only Son, rises from the grave and we get the justice that we had been waiting for, the hope and the victory that we were waiting on that seemed like we were never going to get a risen Christ, a risen Savior, conquering even death. God cannot be outmaneuvered. Death cannot thwart God's program. And let me just remind you, Jehu here, the new king of Israel, 
He's not a great guy. Yes, he is a prophecy fulfiller. Yes, he's been named and anointed and chosen by God for a purpose. Yes, he does the good work of purging Baal worship from Israel and Judah. Yes, he does the good work of ending Jezebel and Ahab's line. The Omri dynasty comes to an end with Jehu. But remember, Jehu is reckless. He's a loose cannon. Jehu himself is quite brutal. And yes, though he is a zealous Yahweh worshiper, he actually won't go far enough. Jehu, though here victorious, here fulfilling the hope that we were waiting for, Jehu is not a very good king. Jehu is brutal and reckless, and his zeal for appropriate Yahweh worship only goes so far. So when we look at a text like this on a Resurrection Sunday, we rejoice to live in this part of history where we have the greatest victorious risen king. He's not a king with a partial victory. He's not a king with a lukewarm zeal for Yahweh worship. He is a good king whose kingdom will have no end. He is a holy and righteous and just king. He's the king of all kings. And he is a benevolent, kind, merciful, and gracious king. Jehu reminds us that no human government will ever satisfy our needs, so we look to King Jesus, who has triumphed over sin and death and all the forces of Satan, who will come again one day to establish his kingdom on earth, to bring his people into his, the fullness of his kingdom, which will have no end. This Resurrection Sunday, we remember the true king. We look and long for his kingdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we see how you have been at work throughout all of human history, and we uh, fear when we live under wicked rulers. We fear political maneuvering, and we fear wicked influences, God. But we remember that you cannot be outmaneuvered. God, despite inept leadership, despite the abundance of sin and death and wickedness, false worship with your holy name applied to it, your people being led astray into idolatry and paganism, God, we remember that you will not be outmaneuvered. We long to see your word fulfilled in its entirety. We long for King Jesus, our risen Savior, and his kingdom. God, we praise and worship him above all else. Our trust is in your word. Our trust is in your sovereignty. Our trust is in King Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.